Welcome to Lama Surya Das's Awakening Now podcast. We are very pleased to share with you Lama's unique illumination of the awakened awareness teachings. If you are interested in supporting Lama Surya Das's podcast, please go to beherenownetwork.com slash Surya Das. Make panang ye yo chu ke panang pa me pa ya kane kandu pa wa show come up a channel come up a channel come up a channel guru all knowing come not mapa heed this cry heed our call hear us heal us turn this way help us hold us Karmapachano, hear our cry. Today, I want to welcome you to this special edition of my Awakening Now podcast series on the Be Here Now Network, founded by Ram Das. The Awakening Now podcast series that I do. Today I'm going to talk about one of my most precious spiritual masters, gurus, Sawe Lama we call it in Tibetan, root guru or heart lama, the miraculous 16th Karmapa, Gyalwa Karmapa, the Buddha Karmapa. This is a book about him, about 10 of my uh, stories are in it. It's an excellent book about the Karmapa, by, compiled by Norma Levine. The 16th Buddha Karmapa, who was a guru to me and to many of my friends. The head of the Kagyu lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. He's the second Lama to the Dalai Lama. He was like the head Lama of Eastern Tibet, the Karmapa, the man of Buddha activity, Karmapa. I was just chanting his mantra, Karma Pacheno, hear me, hold me, turn this way, listen up, listen to us. Karma Pacheno. A lineage stretching back into antiquity to the Mahasiddhas, the great yogic adepts of ancient Tibet, the Kagyu lineage, the whispered oral transmission lineage coming down from Milarepa, Tibet's greatest poet, saint, and cave yogi Milarepa whose hundred thousand songs we still have and have translated and people published and remember today, 1,000 years later. And all the way back to India, to the sages and saints like Talopa, and back to the primordial Buddha, the formless Dharmakaya, Vajradhara or Dorje Chung, the Buddha who sits like this, blue, naked, etc. Karmapa Rinpoche, or the Karmapa as we call him, Kundun, or His Holiness, or uh, just remembering him, I'm so full of emotion and feeling. He was considered an emanation of the Buddha of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, the great Buddha of Compassion, Kuan Yin, called Kuan Yin in China, Kanon in Japan, Chenrezig in Tibet, and Avalokita. She who watches over the world, she who hears our cries, the great compassionate one. One of the great incarnations of this Buddha, like the Dalai Lama also, Avalokiteshvar with his mantra, Om Mani Padme Hung, the jewel in the lotus mantra, the six syllable mantra, the Buddha is within us mantra. The Karmapa was such a wonderful Lama in my mind, he was the greatest Lama I've ever met, and I knew, not just met, knew many or most of them all. 
including the Dalai Lama and the heads of the other sects, Sakya Trichin Rinpoche, Holiness Dujan Rinpoche, and others, Kala Rinpoche, Drukchen Rinpoche, etc. All the great masters when I was in the Himalayas and in the West, the Karmapa Rinpoche I knew, I met in Sikkim in 1972 or three, when my own original refuge Lama and Lama Kalu Rinpoche, the Karmapa's meditation master, the Dalai Lama's Tibetan yoga teacher and master, the late great Kalu Rinpoche, sent me from his monastery in Darjeeling, West Bengal, India, in the Himalayas foothills above Calcutta to see His Holiness Karmapa at his Rimtek Monastery in Sikkim. And the Karmapa welcomed us. There were just a few of us Westerners there in those days coming and going in that border region. And it was a wonderful opportunity to be with him. And we could only get a one or two week special permit visa to be in that border region. Sikkim was swallowed up by India some decades ago and is part of India now. It used to be a Buddhist principality. It's on the border of China, India, and Nepal, and is very um, important strategic position there in the Himalayas. So it's a border zone, and it's hard to stay there. If you're a foreigner, they're very worried about politics and spies and the Chinese communists and all that taking over or the Americans for that matter, or British coming back. So we used to visit him sometimes there. And there are many stories I could tell about this great Lama, the Karmapa, who in many ways is equal to the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama is great, great, wonderful also, of course. And we love him and he's still alive and still comes to this country and so many countries every year on his mission of human rights and peace and understanding and compassion not just trying to free Tibet and Tibetan peoples, but his universal bodhisattva mission of altruism and compassion. And now the environment as well, and the Tibetan environment is very threatened by the Chinese deforesting the Himalayas, and which is the source of many of Asia's rivers and so forth, and strip mining its resources and taking them away to mainland China. So it's a grave concern for many of us that care about the environment of the Himalayas, not just Tibet, as well as Tibet. Of course, these days, China has risen as a world power, so Tibetan's voice is not very strong, but the Dalai Lama and the Karmapa carry it forward. And my teacher, the Karmapa, he left this world while he was visiting America for the third or fourth time in 1981 in Zion, Illinois. And he remained in meditation for three days after he stopped breathing. That was a marvel. And this is traditional for Tibetan yogis. And a couple of my Lama friends were there and told me what happened. It was very remarkable. And the doctors and nurses who attended him in that hospital for a week were so moved and touched by him that um, until this day they have kept like his shrine and a picture and a place of honor for him at that hospital, even though they're by no means Buddhist followers or Oriental philosophy students or anything like that. Uh, I myself saw the Karmapa do a few miraculous things. Um, he also comes to me in dreams and so on. And I'm trying to think of what would be a good story to tell about this enlightened guru. There are so many. So I'm just reaching back in my mind and thinking, when I first met the Karmapa, Oh, here in my little holy book of my guru's pictures, here's Kala Rinpoche and the Karmapa and others, Kinsi Rinpoche and so on. Here's the first time I ever met Karmapa. And a professional photographer there happened to snap this picture with a telephoto lens. That's the back of my curly Afro-American Jufro head. And the Karmapa gave me the world's biggest, sunniest smile. And we were on a line going forward one by one to be blessed by him. And ever since then, and that was in 1972, what, what, 73, I can't remember exactly. And I was a very young man. And we just had such a karmic connection. 
and I had the privilege of being with him and traveling a little with him and being with him in Sikkim at his monastery, Rumtek, and in Nepal at Tukor Rinpoche's monastery, which he and Chikini Rinpoche built for the Karmapa, and other places, New York, Paris, Woodstock, New York, Chicago, and Washington. We stayed with Senator Charles Percy, who was devoted to him. And we had a wonderful, um, I don't know, not special relationship, special for me. He was, he was, of course, he didn't speak English, and I was learning Tibetan at the time, but we communicated, and it was often translators, and I had many teachings from him, meditated from him. Um, but I remember once, I'm trying to think of a, a good a miracle story, that book of the, about the miraculous come up is full of wisdom and his way, how he treated people, but also of miracles and dreams and visions and what the other lamas thought. A lot of lamas were sort of intimidated by him. We were sort of, we would say, everyone's afraid of the Karmapa because he can see through us. And also he had, dare I say this, a bit of a temper. He was a wrathful guru, not a very, very, very a peaceful, gentle guru like the Dalai Lama who doesn't show his um, emotions, let's say, too much in public. And the Karmapa once pinched one of my Lama friends, Lama Norla, under the arm when we were taking a small group picture. And in the picture, you could see Lama Norla's face is like this, all screwed up, but I didn't know why. I, and, and then later he said the Karmapa had pinched him under there, was fooling around with him and calling him Lama Roly Poly which is Lama Norla's nickname with the Karmapa, Lama Rilly Milly. And the La Lama Norla showed me a big black and blue welt there with a great glorious Archbishop Cardinal of the Kagyu Tibetan Buddhist Church. The Karmapa had pinched him, sort of given him a noogie or whatever you want to call it, the way monks and brothers and sisters do play in the litter in which they've grown up together. So he was very intimate with us. I always used to have a beard and long hair or an afro, what they used to call a Jufro when I went to college in New York and uh, in the 60s. And the Karmapu, again, now in the 70s when I was there, the Karmapu was so intimate with us. And he used to pull my beard and say the name of his second incarnation, Karmapakshi. He would say, Karmapakshi, Karmapakshi, because Karmapakshi was the one Karmapa that had a little goatee, a beard. If you know Asians, you know Asian men don't grow much of a beard. Uh, it's, it's a genetic thing. And um, Karmapa had a little uh, goatee in his second incarnation uh, about six or seven hundred years ago, the great Karmapakshi, the second the Karmapa. Our Karmapa, Rangjung Rigpe Dorje, the spontaneous diamond thunderbolt of innate awareness was the 16th Karmapa. The Dalai Lama is the 14th Karma, uh, Dalai Lama. This is the 16th incarnation of the Karmapa Rinpoche's or enlightened lamas. And uh, he was the first reincarnated lama of Tibet. The Dalai Lama came later, 100, 200 years later. And the Karmapa died, left this world in 1970, um, or the same before in Chicago, 1981, in December. And um, the next year, a boy was born in Ch Tibet, now part of China, who was in a few years recognized as the Karmapa. So the 17th Karmapa grew up in... in um, I have a picture of him here somewhere. The 17th Karmapa grew up in China until he was about uh, 11, 12, 13. And he escaped in the middle of the night and walked through the Himalayas with one or two of his monk assistants. And they walked for about a month and it was very dangerous and walking at night and escaping from the Chinese and um, he was a very important like political prisoner under house arrest. And he escaped to India and he showed up at the Dalai Lama's 
government in exile in Dharamsala, India, in the Himalayas foothills, and surprised the Dalai Lama. And of course, they didn't have cell phones and communications in those days. Also, it was a secret escape, and this was much written about in the news when this 16th, 17th Karmapa young teenager escaped from communist China and found political asylum in India and was somewhat trained and brought up by the Dalai Lama as well as Tai Si to Rinpoche and Trangu Kempo. Um, I have a few other pictures here of this 17th Karmapa, this boy, the reincarnation, here when he was a little younger, about the time he came out of Tibet. And here, a little older, about 25 more recently, he's pushing 30 now, and he's come to America a few times. The great 17th Karmap Urjen Trinley, the lotus of liberating Buddha activity, liberating the beings activity mission. And he's a wonderful enlightened Lama, caught in a bit of, a, you know, between the old, China, India, and the West, the old world and the new tradition and our scientific postmodern era and so on. Of course, he speaks a bunch of languages, including English. And um, when I could tell you stories he, just in passing. For example, we were in Palo Alto together, meeting a bunch of people on his visit and to Silicon Valley, and uh, they gave him, and I introduced him when he spoke to at the Google campus to the Google executives and people, a few hundred, and um, they gave him a ride in the automatic, in the driverless car, which was a big thrill for him, but also scary, he said. So, you know, a good time is had by all these. Uh, they have a very human side to them, these saints and sages, like the wonderful Pope we have today, Pope Francis. And I have not been a fan of some recent popes like Pope Benedict, but Pope Francis, we love and hope he can continue to do more and more. So this 17th Karmapa is in India most of the time, but he's come to the West American Europe a few times. And he's a wonderful Lama. But my guru was a 16th Karmapa, and he is so... Uh, wise and loving. Oh, and here's a picture of him when he came out of Tibet, and a formal photo with the Dalai Lama when he first came out of Tibet and got political asylum here. Around here means in India, around 1990. My mind's in India there with the Lama Monastery, and um, maybe 1988 or something like that, 1990. The Karmapa was an artist and a scholar. Well, the 16th Karmapa wasn't that much of a book person, but he had a lot of visions and things like that. And in his current incarnation, he does a lot of calligraphies and writes poems, and the 17th Karmapa had a vision of the goddess, the Buddha goddess Tara, the Buddha, the female Buddha, yes, there are female Buddhist friends, like Kuan Yin and this Tara Buddha. And this is, this is the 17th Karmapas. I know it can, can be confusing with all the names being the same. So I'm going to show you the picture again. We're talking about the 17th Karmapa now, who's 30 years old. When he was about 18 or 20, he had this vision of Tara in a rainbow swirl, a tigli, a, like a universal dimension, like a cosmic sphere, the, the great round, and the dimension. And he painted this. And this is how Tara looks in, to the 17th Karmapa. I think that's pretty cool. Not just an old painting and iconographical representation in the old ways, like this one, of the old ways that Tibetans painted. The Karmapas, like the Dalai Lamas, have been recognized, as I mentioned before, since six, seven, hundred, eight hundred years ago. And in, of course, Eastern thought often 
people believe in and take for granted even rebirth and reincarnation. Most Buddhists do, Hindus and others in Eastern ways, Eastern religions, let's say, if you want to narrow it down to that. Um, of course, let's not forget that Western people also believed in it, and some still do, for a very long time. I mean, in the, in the modern polls of religions, you can find out that Ameri even like 30 or 35 percent of Americans believe in reincarnation of some kind. It's been um, shown. But Jews and Christians, until the time of a Christian Reformation Council, the Council of Nicaea in 354 AD in the Holy Land, Palestine, wrote reincarnation out of the um, various forms of the Bible and the Gospels. You can look this up, world scholarship, history. Until then, reincarnation was part of it, and you can find examples in the scriptures about this, how uh, the Baal Shem Tov of Judaism in the uh, 1600s, I think, in Europe, was the a spark of the soul of ancient Rabbi Akiba, that's like reincarnation talk, and uh, how John the Baptist was in, in Jesus' time, who presaged his way for Jesus at that time. John the Baptist, who lost his head John the, in, in the history story, John the Baptist was the rebirth of the prophet Isaiah, you can read this in the Bible even today, Google it. People used to ask the rabbi or ask the lama, now you can ask Google, it's easy. Um, hopefully you get something reliable, you never know with Wikipedia or with the news today. Um, so the first Karmapa was a, not called Karmapa, he was the disciple of Tibet's great yogi Milarepa. Milarepa's disciple, and when he died, he predicted that he would be reborn somewhere, and the disciples found him, and he became known as Karmapakshi, and then the third one was Rangjung Dorje, and by the fourth one, it was being generally known that these lamas predicted their rebirth, and that their heirs, whoever they passed it on to, their successors, found the rebirth as a boy in somewhere in that region, let's call it Tibet. Sometimes they found them in China or Nepal or Ladakh, but in that general region. These days, sometimes they find the reincarnate lamas in other countries as Tibetans, and this karma has spread over the whole world. So the karmapas often leave a letter or a prediction or a poem or something to indicate how to find the child of course, it's always a boy being an East age, Asian religion, but it doesn't always have to be a boy. And they find the boy, and then they give him some tests when he's three or four. Um, and they, there may be two or three boys that are contending or that have some signs, or the lamas have some dreams or miracle visions about it. And they give him some tests, like they show him some ritual objects, like a bell, and some meditation beads, and some other things that belong to the last Karmapa, and then some other shiny, th similar things that didn't belong to the Karmapa, and they see how many the boy, the child recognizes. This is, they do this with the Dalai Lamas too. And this Dalai Lama, apparently when the search party came to find him, and you can read this, I think, in his autobiography, it may even be in the movie Kundun by... Scorsese, which is a cool movie with great award-winning music by Philip Glass, a Tibetan Buddhist. Um, this Dalai Lama, when they came to find him, he recognized the disguised monks on horseback as the Rinpoches that he knew in his past life. And he spoke to them in the dialect that they used to speak in the capital of Lhasa, Tibet in the past life, not in the dialect that that boy spoke in his uh, village. And remember, he was three or four years old, so he didn't learn any other languages or dialects. And then he recognized all 12 of the objects that were his and didn't pick any of the imitation objects. And everybody bowed and cried and said, this, 
this is our master. This is the Dalai Lama, even though he's only three or four. And it's a very, very touching scene. Some of that's in the movie Kundun. Some of it's in the Dalai Lama's biography or autobiography, My Land, My People. So the Karmapa, likewise, it was found that way. And if you look into the history these days, history is not just, you know, from ancient times. The 16th, 17th Karmapas have been found that way, more or less, and the Dalai Lama is up to this 14th one. Uh, in, in recent times, the 17th one was born in China and was hard to find. Buddhist and Tibetan Lamas, refugees, don't have easy access to going to China unless they have for example, a diplomatic passport from another country, or there are American or Indian citizens, or Bhutan citizens, Bhutanese citizens. So not many monks and nuns and Tibetan lamas go back and forth easily into Red China, which owns Tibet, so they don't can't visit Tibet very easily. So this Karmapa was there, recognized by the Dalai Lama and Tai Si Rinpoche and others. But there is another candidate who lives in New Delhi, and I think he was born in Bhutan, who Shama Rinpoche recognized, and that's an old whole political hoo-ha. Uh, you can look it up. It's like, you know, at one time there were two popes, one in Rome, I think, and one in Aix-en-Provence in France. I can't remember why, a few hundred years ago. So there's often several reincarnations of a Lama anyway, so maybe it's true, who knows. But this recognizing of tuku is very important because this is how the lineage in one way is passed on and in another way it's passed on from master to disciple. But this is the reincarnation part of it. And this is how the monastery and the lands and you know all that in that old society is carried on because monks don't have children. So the reincarnation is the one that's the successor of the previous that leads the community in the next decades. So we're all wondering what the Dalai Lama is going to do and what's going to happen with the situation with China and India and Tibetan exile if the Dalai Lama should die. Unfortunately, he has said he could easily live to 92, 94, 102, so we're all very excited about that because we love his holiness and he's still going strong even though he's not that young. He's 83 or 4 years young. His holiness the Dalai Lama. But now we have the 30-year-old Karmapa and other lamas like him of the lineage to take over when these old lamas, older lamas are gone. Like this great Gyawang Drukpa Rinpoche, who I, was his English teacher in Darjeeling in the 70s when he was 10 years old, so we've always been close. The 12th Gyawang Drukpa and others who will hang on and take, take on the responsibility Here's Gyawang Drukpa, the dragon lama of the Drukpa Kagyu, which is always the Dalai Lama. And these uh, next generation of lamas, plus those of us who were trained, Asian or in some cases Western, male or female, can carry on this lineage and this Buddha activity, this beneficial activity. The Karmapa is famous for his miracles and for recognizing reincarnations or tukus himself. It's one of his greatest qualities. Many, uh, I think the 16th Karmapa, my root guru, again, who died and who left this world in Chicago on a teaching trip here in 1984. Not 1984, 1981, December. He recognized hundreds of reincarnate lamas during the first generation of the Hejiro, the exodus from Tibet and the scattering over India and Southeast Asia and eventually the world of the Tibetan refugees after the communist army, Chinese armies took over in 1959 and the Dalai Lama and those who could fled to India. Prime Minister Nehru, Pandit Nehru gave them sanctuary as well as the Queen of Bhutan and the royal family of Nepal. The Karmapa had many visions. He recognized tukus. He could see people's past and future lives. When he consecrated a new monastery in Sikkim, his monastery, Rumtek, outside Gangtok, the capital of Sikkim, that Himalayan principality, 
whose king was a Kagyu Tulku, a reincarnate Lama, who was married to a New York socialite, Hope Goldberg, Hope something, who knows. Who can remember? She was an American socialite married to the king of Sikkim and lived there as a queen, this Buddhist reincarnation. And then India annexed Sikkim and everything changed. But that king of Sikkim, the Maharaja, he gave Karmapa Rinpoche some land. So when they came out of Tibet, they could build a monastery and educate the lamas and nuns and lay people of the Kagyu order. Sikkim's a lovely, warm, and temperate country like Bhutan. Well, now it's part of India. And um, we used to go there. I used to go there in the 70s. And you needed a special permit to go there from the... Indian government and all, and scholars and translators and people used to go there. I remember I met Werner Earhart there, the founder of EST, a consciousness expansion, mind training, sort of the spiritual development program popular in the 70s and 80s. Perhaps it became called the landmark training after that, who can remember? And other luminaries and scholars used to come there to see the Karmapa and the other Rinpoches and <clears throat> It was wonderful. Uh, I remember they said that the story was that when the monastery is built and then they tr <clears throat> they put up uh, 108 po uh, trees, uh, poles, and they hung prayer flags on them to flutter in the wind and spread the prayers that were written on the prayer flags all over. It's a Himalayan custom, probably from shamanic days predating Buddhism in Tibet. The bone is the uh, indigenous original religion there, bone. It's probably from shamanic bone principles, who knows, with the elements and the allies and the invisible beings and earth and fire, wind, uh, spreading the prayers from the prayer flags to all the beings in the water and the air and everywhere. So the last, the biggest pole with the biggest prayer flag was going to be raised on the day, the hour of the consecration, the blessing of the monastery, the new monastery is opening by the great 16th Karmapa Lama. So when it came that day and thousands of people were gathered and it was outside on this hilt, hilly plateau where the monastery was built, it's much more built up now, but it's, now I'm going back to the late 60s, I wasn't there. Some of my friends were there and saw this. There were many monks pulling on a very, very, very thick, long rope, trying to lift up this pole, with this giant pole, prayer flag pole, made out of a tree, a thin, long, well, sapling, I guess, with all these colored flags hung on it, and they couldn't lift it up. And the Karmapa clapped his hands and went like this. with his awesome gaze. He had the most intense gaze. Remember, everybody was intimidated by him, including high lamas, because he could see through them, us. And the pole went up. Of course, the monks were still pulling, but they couldn't pull it without Karmapa's help, I guess. Anyway, the gigantic prayer pole went up, and everybody was like, was, was struck, and like bowed to the Karmapa. And then one of the learned lamas, when it was his turn to speak and pray and everything, he said how this was so much reminded him of the lineage blessings that have come down from, for example, the second Karmapa. Now we have this wonderful lama, the 16th, and we just saw his sort of external powers, which great masters never show their powers unless it's really needed. And he never talks about, but we've seen them in other times too, in even more dire situations in our refugee life. It reminds me of the second Karmapa when there was a big statue made, a Buddha statue, to be put in one of the first temples that he, I think it was the first meditation hall, shrine hall, temple, they call it Gampa there in Tibet, in eastern Tibet. And the mold had been a little off. Remember, they made these things a long time ago, before computers and before measuring instruments and compasses. I don't know. They, they had uh, cast this huge bronze statue of the Buddha, and it was a little leaning to the side. 
So this is a historical story about the second Karmapa with the beard, Karmapakshi, Karmapakshi, who was the guru of the Ch emperor of China at the time. The second Karmapa gave his all-seeing, they call it omniscient, I'll say all-seeing Karmapa, Samadhi, focus, gaze, stare. And then he went like this. And as he moved his body upright and straightened out his inner channels and chakras, so did the statue, the bigger than life size, heavy bronze statue. And then it was sitting up straight ever since through the centuries in that temple. And they called that Buddha Karma Pakshi, even though it was of Lord Buddha Sakyamuni, because Karma Pakshi, I mean, this is my interpretation, had straightened that Buddha out, which we all need. And that's why we need gurus like this, enlightened masters that can straighten us out, straighten out our chakras and channels, our inner chakras and channels in our spine, if you like. Straighten out our head, if your head's bent or crooked, and I don't just mean your physique. Straighten out the knots in our chakras and channels, and you might say, oh, I, we don't believe in chakras and channels. We have microscopes and fMRIs and PET scans today, we can see we have organs and vertebrae and skeletons and arteries and capillary systems and all that, glands. But still there's the energy body, there's the energy and so on. And perhaps what they used to diagnose in Tibetan medicine as blocked channels or knots in our nadis, our energy ch pathways or chakras, knots. Maybe these are things that we would in modern psychology call hang-ups or neuroses and so forth. So we can straighten out those things and get back to the natural state, health. Illness is disease, health is the natural state. We don't get health from outside or from the master. Health is inherent in us. We get sick and we can rebalance and harmonize that through the medicine of dharma, of spiritual panaceas, like unselfish love, like empathic compassion, like transcendental wisdom, and so on. Dharma, in a word, that which heals what afflicts us, dharma, spiritual wisdom and teaching and some practice, dharma. So I found this to be true. I've had some healings from masters, outer healings, physical healings, inner healings, like energy or attitude, healings. We can get physical health. We can get mental health this way. We can learn to heal ourselves and others also. These are the healing arts, physical health, mental health, emotional health environmental health, these are all things that we can affect if we tune into the timeless wisdom traditions like this one I'm talking about and the universal perennial philosophy, the timeless wisdom traditions that are all around us. It would be nice if wisdom became more in vogue today as has recently mindfulness, as has recently yoga and compassion. Wisdom seems to me to be like an endangered natural resource and we overlook it at our peril, although there are good quantities or reservoirs of it, we seem to be losing touch with how to mine the ore and refine it. So I'm all for wisdom. Let's wisen up and become wise elders instead of jaded old fools, wise elders together. And be more like the Karmapas. I don't really engage in the Karmapa controversy about whether there's one Karmapa or two. In my mind, everyone is a part of the Karmapa energy. That we're all Buddhas by nature, Karmapas. We only have to awaken to them what we are and can be. That's the message of awakening now of the Kagyu Mahamudra and Dzogchen lineage. The Karmapa was very lovey and kind, as well as a wrathful, intense guy. He can be playful. I remember sitting with him on the floor in his room, and usually he would sit on his bed or on a, 
above us a little in, in formal situations, but in his bedroom upstairs in the monastery room tech, he would sit on the floor and his feet would be sticking out. And I'd be there maybe with one or two of my friends, maybe with a translator, Achi, a tall, handsome Tibetan guy, was the translator at the time, not a monk, Achi. Maybe he'd come out of Tibet with the Karmapa. Probably, I can't remember. He was still probably about 30. Karmapa was probably 45, 50 at that time. And one of my friends, Brian Miller, was there, who's a tall American from Boston. <clears throat> he lives in Bangkok now with his wife. He's a lawyer. Not Bangkok, sorry, Singapore. Longtime Buddhist practitioner and disciple of the Karmapa and Tai Situ Rinpoche, who lives in India, great lama who's the guru of the current 17th Karmapa, Tai Si Trivice, is a great guru today. The Karmapa had some guests come. They came kind of unexpectedly, some ministers and their wives and judges and their wives in the high court of India. And we didn't really know who they were, but there was some kerfuffle outside the door, and, and somebody came in and whispered to Karmapa and to Achi in Tibetan, and Brian and I were sitting there on the floor, in our white Indian clothes or maroon jeans or something, and uh, probably trying to stay warm. These were not places with central heating or cushions or on the floor or comf comfies. It was a monastery and refugee camp situa setting in the early 70s, a little different than it is now, a few generations later. And these important guests swept in, and a few chairs were brought, and they sat on the chairs. And the women were dolled up in sari, saris, and the men in suits, and some had turbans, and one had a military uniform on like a general, and a bunch of medals. And they spoke English, some of them, and the Karmapa didn't. But, so, you know, but uh, we were sort of on the side, sitting at the foot of Karmapa's bed, and he got up, he sat on the bed, they put a, a rug on the bed, made it look like a couch, and he sat there kind of with his robes, receiving them. And they had some chit-chat, in Hindi or Sikhimese, I don't know, we didn't really understand. And then I, I saw they were asking about us, these visitors, and the Kamapa, I don't know what he said, but the translator said to uh, my friend Brian, who was maybe taller than me, I'm 6'2", maybe he was 6'2 and a half or 3, His Holiness told these people that you had really great karma and you, to practice the Dharma. And, and, and the proof is that you're so tall that you could even reach up and take the bulb out of the ceiling. This is how he played with us. We were like his mascots that day in front of these ministers and Supreme Court justices and their wives of India. I mean, maybe the wives were the ministers. Who knows? I never knew what was going on in all those years that I was there. I still don't, really. Uh, so Brian stood up. And he reached up, and it was a bare bulb. Remember where we are. It was a bare bulb. It was not a hotel. And he reached up, and he twisted, and he took it out. And the Karmapa said to the visitor, see, see, good karma. So tall. And then he pointed at me. And, I, and Brian gave me the bulb. So I reached up and on my tiptoes and stretched and put it back in. And Karmapa said again to these big shots, like, See, see, Ringbow, Ringbow, good karma. <laughs> so we, that's how he played with us. He was so, oh, and I'm guaranteed, he, and he pulled my beard and said, Karma Pakshi, Karma Pakshi, maybe patted me on the head. Remember, I'm like about 23. I, so I was like, I guess to him, we were cute. We also had come a long way and we were very devoted and we didn't, we weren't doing anything else there. We were there meditating and studying under them and trying to teach monks English and things every day. So we were very much part of their monastery family and had even special privileges because we were the foreign guests of closeness, intimacy, being in the Karmapa's bedroom every day and things like that, and the other Rinpoche's, Triangle Rinpoche, Tai Situ, Sharma, and all the great lamas that were there. Wonderful. Another day, Karmapa, the Karmapa, um, I think Brian, but somebody must have asked him, what, what, because that story circulated, what's the big deal about being so tall? Of course, you know, you have to project your mind to Asia, where most people are small, 
smaller than Americans, not average. And Brian and I, some of us are taller than average. I mean, average might be for a man 5'11 or 6 feet. I don't know for Americans. I'm not a statistician. But so what's the big deal with tall? Why is that good karma? And the karmapa, being a teacher, took it seriously and he answered with his Buddhist mind. And he said, well, every time you do a prostration, which we were doing at the time as part of our Nundra Foundation practices of Tibetan Buddhism, you cover a lot more ground. So this is really a superior prostration. You're, you're really humbling yourself more than a short person to go down so much lower than a short person has to go. <laughs> so this was kind of half joking and facetious and half serious about karma. It's a little hard to understand, but don't discount it. It's like obviously quality and what you're doing internally is more important than what your body's doing in, in like the prayer life, let's say. But also what your body's doing has some part of it too. So I'm telling you an odd story because it's funny and it's a happy story about being close to the Karmapa. I could also tell you, but you're not supposed to talk about your spiritual experiences, how the Karmapa, who is famous for his black crown ceremony, I'm looking for a picture of him in one of these books which shows the black crown him holding the black crown. It's a kind of esoteric ceremony where he sits like this and he chants the mantra and he transmits that to you. He's known as the Black Crown Lama. There's a whole book about this called The Black Crown Lama by Nick Douglas and Penny Slinger. When you see the Karmapa like that and you meditate with him, then it's, it says it sows the seed of enlightenment for certain. So... My friends and I, so here's a picture. Here's the book, The History of the Karmapas. Here's a picture of the black crown ceremony, the Karmapa. And nobody's supposed to touch that crown except the Karmapa. And it was given to him by the fifth, it was given to the fifth Karmapa by the Emperor Yung Lo of China, who was his disciple and had a vision of the Karmapa like this in the full moon. So he had this crown woven with jewels and silk and presented to the Karmapa, and it's been passed down since then. And here's a statue of the Karmapa in that way. So this is something you see all over the Himalayas, and it comes down from ancient times. Of course, in the tradition, the Lamas say that this crown is woven of the 100,000 jet black hairs of the wisdom dakinis, who protect him and are always with him and those who succeed or follow in this lineage. That it wasn't really made by the emperor. Where well, the emperor saw the real crown, so he had this replica made. But the real crown is always above the Karmapa's head, hovering. And that's why the Karmapa does the ceremony holding that crown on so it doesn't just soar off. This is how it is taught. So I didn't see that soaring off, but I've been in that ceremony many times, and he's done it in America also. As I said, I'm not going to talk about my experiences and dreams and visions, but it does occur to me that even in Woodstock, actually it was in Putnam County at the land that Mr. Shen gave, that when the Karmapa did that kind of thing, I saw him as Buddha and me as Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, an infinite shining rays, and I was bouncing up and down. I was sitting cross-legged with my friends, having like not really an epileptic fit, but like an ecstatic kundalini experience or not even that something. And um, the light, the Buddha light was coming in and going out for me at the same time, and there was no outside and inside, and that's enough to say. That's more than enough. So I take these miracle stories with a grain of salt, sometimes with a pitcher of salt, but now I'm pouring out the miracle tea myself with no salt. There are other stories. I, I mean, for example, I, help, I found, help find and start the Karmapas Monastery in America, KTD, Karma Triana Dharma Chakra. 
on the mountaintop in Woodstock, New York, where I lived, and I first invited the Kagyu Lamas to come there in 76 and 7, and Kempo Kata Rinpoche and others came there, looked at it, and then brought Jamgan Kantra Rinpoche, and then brought, we brought the Karmapa in 79 or 80, and now it's a nice built-up monastery. It was an old hotel then that President Ulysses Grant had summered at and things like that. It's on a high hilltop overlooking the whole Catskills on Mead Mountain, Mount Guardian, overlooking Woodstock, New York, that fabled art community. And um, I really wanted to enter into the three-year Lama training, the three-year, three-month, three-day cloistered monastic retreat that Kala Rinpoche and my other teachers had encouraged us to do, and that was how the entire tradition was transmitted, and you get to practice that and retreat and for the rest of your life. And the Karmapa predicted that I would go in to it the next year in um, November. And so I said, Your Holiness, Yeshi Norbu, that's what we call them. We call the Dalai Lama Kunda in the presence. We call the Karmapa in person Yeshi Norbu, the all-knowing, all-seeing jewel, precious, all-knowing, all-seeing jewel. And uh, he is. And he said, it was kind of a prediction. But like with all these things, it's a little vague. He didn't tell me where or when or how. And so after that, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder when Kala Rinpoche or the Karmapa or my other guru might have a three-year retreat, which is a rare thing in the West. And there was one going in France was the only one I knew about. And that was not going to be starting in the next year. It was already underway. And uh, then within about a month, Tukapema Wangiel told me that he was starting one in France in another place in the door done for his father's students. My first Dzogchen master, Kanjur Rinpoche, who's also the Venerable Matthew Ricard's master and others, Gene, Gene Smith of the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center's master, etc., the great Kitsi Rinpoche and Kanjur Rinpoche, and he invited me, or he sort of let it be known that I would be very welcome. I was one of their original students in India. So the next no November, surprise, I went to France and helped finish building that cloistered retreat center and stayed there in there for two and a half, three-year retreats. So the first three and a half year retreat, and then the second one, and then during the third one, our guru in residence at Dujum Rinpoche died. So we got involved with that and taking care of his remains and bringing it to Nepal. So the Karmapa left this world in 1981 while I was in my first three-year retreat there in France. And I had dreams of him almost every night during that year. It was amazing. It was like seeing him. And here I have some of his ashes from his cremation pyre inside of this gal, which is a reliquary locket that Tibetans wear or hang around their neck. Like here, I have a small one with some of them in here, in this gao or relic, relic locket. And here's most of them, which were given to me later. After my retreat, this, they saved to me in Woodstock because I wasn't there. But he uh, visited me in dreams. And one time, he even uh, predicted, I mean, he, I was sitting up all night in my meditation, box, as we call it, seat, in the three retreat, my monks robe the shaved head, and I had this dream where Tara, the female Buddha, told me that Tara is going to be reborn on the eighth month and the eighth day in and I couldn't understand what she said, and that I should call Rinpoche. I think it started with an A, like ah, Rinpoche. It's so clear, I can still hear it now, it's like a clear light dream, not just the usual murky dream. And I can still hear it now, just a few years later. Oh, 1981 or two. So it's like 34 years later. I can still hear it. And uh, so the next day, during lunch hour, I went to my teacher, Nyosho Kempo's room, and I said, Rinpoche, Rinpoche, of course, talking to him in my broken Tibetan. He didn't speak much English. And oh, yeah, a dream of Karmapa. Tara told me he's going to be reborn in the eighth day, and, he, and I should call uh, Rinpoche. And I, I was so sure that 
Kempa was going to say, like my teachers always did, oh, it's just a dream, just let it go, or everything's like a dream, nothing to do. Go, you know, just keep meditating, keep practicing. We're in retreat, there's no phone here anyway. But what Kempo said was, what's the number? <laughs> Where? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. Well, I got was like, ah, Rinpoche, what did he He said, well, what to do? I guess keep meditating. <laughs> That was the end of that. Of course, within a few years, we found out the Karmapa was born a year later, but not on the eighth day of the eighth month or anything that I had especially uh, heard in the dream. So there are a lot of uh, stories I could tell, but um, of course, the Karmapa Lama was a person of the male gender who came from Tibet. And then he left this world. He died in 1981, November or December, in Zion, Illinois, near Chicago, in a hospital from stomach cancer when he's 59. Then he was reborn, according to tradition, and Dalai Lama and others recognize this and agree. He was reborn and found in China, and then he escaped, and now he's living in India in Dharamsala. He's the head of our Kagyu whispered or linear school, descended from Milarepa and Tilopa and back to the primordial Buddha, and so on. But all of that's inside of us. And the Karmapa principle or the Buddha nature is in all of us, and that's really the important transmission or teaching that the Karmapas intend or the, Buddha, the Buddhas intend for us to get, to receive. And when we, we, we receive this transmission, we realize nothing has been transmitted it's just like resonating or echoing with what's inside of us. So we see them as Buddha, but maybe ourselves as a lower or imperfect being, but they don't see us the way we see ourselves. They see us as Buddhas, maybe asleep Buddhas or dozing Buddhas, but uh, the intent is for us to awaken and be a light in the world just like them, not a blight on the landscape and be a bodhisattva, a spiritual awakener, an altruist, a peace warrior, a spiritual leader, elder, help, helper in the world. Bodhisattva, we call it. A spiritual hero. And so we try. We take the vow. We try to emulate these masters, not imitate them, but as they became their full blossomed selves, like the lotus fully blossomed, reveals the jewel within. Om Mani Padme Hum as we, our spirituality and our true nature, authenticity unfolds, we become our true Buddha self or Karmapa self or Bodhisattva self, not just our selfish, neurotic, little separate ego self, but more realize and identify with all and treat others as we would be treated because they are us. And see the light in everyone and everything, not just in those we like. And that helps us love our enemies and be tolerant of diversity and harm no one. When I see myself in you, how could I harm you? How could I exploit you? Karmapacheno. So this is about the 16th Karmapa and his current rebirth, the 17th, who will, I'm certain, will certainly come to America again mm -hmm. soon. And uh, that's really the deep message is as Buddha did, we can do not only one Buddha in the past or one Karmapa or 16th Karmapa or 14th Dalai Lama, but everybody can awaken and be wise, loving, unselfish in that way too, through walking such a path and digging deep into ourselves together and seeing through the illusion of separateness and opening our hearts, awakening our minds and being like the yeast that leavens the whole loaf, that brings up the whole loaf of humanity and all beings. The 16th Karmapa, like the 14th Dalai Lama, the 16th, my guru was very different and special than the other Karmapas in um, one way, because of their unique circumstance, perhaps, of, not, of being uh, forced out of their country and being refugees. 
so that unlike the previous Dalai Lamas and Karmapas, who maybe once or twice, some of them had gone all the way to Beijing, China, or all the way to Bodh Gaya, India. Most of them hadn't been that far outside Tibet. But the Karmapa, like the Dalai Lama, was found political sanctuary in India in the time of Prime Minister Nehru in 1959, 1960. The Dalai Lama was on the cover of Time magazine at that time. It was big news that the Dalai Lama had escaped from the communist forces and was in India and sought political sanctuary. He was a world leader. Tibet was a country. He was known as a sage and saint. And uh, the Karmapa likewise. So the Dalai Lama and the Karmapa were unique in that they traveled all over the world and visited many, many countries and taught there and inspired people and um, spread the good word and modeled a way of being loving and compassionate and not bitter and hateful, not an enraged Buddhist, but an engaged Buddhist in the world, working for refugee rights and the environment and universal human rights and compassion and to save animals from slaughter and torture and their upbringing and so on. And uh, this is a very uh, special feature of the Karmapa. For example, his hobby, if you could say that, was r rare birds. He was an amateur ornithologist. And on the roof of his monastery in Ribtek Sikkim, there were many dozens of big cages outside on the roof and uh, f full of exotic birds some from India, some from abroad, some big like ostriches, some small, some of them who could talk. talk. The Karmapa taught himself because he went up there every day. I mean, I saw him up there at three in the morning in his underskirt. It's like his underwear pajamas. And uh, I don't know why I was up there. He was teaching the birds to chant his mantra, Karmapa Cheno, and uh, some of them did, the parrots and some other kinds. And uh, sometimes he said, these, these birds, they're good practitioners, but the reason they're birds is they were monks or nuns in the past life, and they were bad monks or nuns, and they got, they got in trouble. <laughs> and now they've come back to me, but they're still chanting Karmapacheno, and it's good for them, and we're still together. He was very loving, and he loved birds. Even when he was visiting us in Woodstock, he wanted to go and visit the animal sanctuaries, the zoos, and we had to take him all the way to the, from Woodstock, New York, about two or three hours drive past Albany to some kind of rare bird farm where they had emus and peasant, pheasants and peacocks and big rare birds, and he brought a couple back and we had to erect uh, one or two outdoor bird, big bird cages uh, for his birds. It was very funny. And he loved those birds, and he would feed them himself from his own hands, his elegant, aristocratic hands that generally weren't involved in cooking and cleaning, I'm sh I assure you. And uh, it was wonderful how he, he, he loved his pets and birds and really all beings. He, he was a beautiful being himself. And uh, perhaps that was his special quality. He wasn't a book person. He was an animal lover and all beings. The Dalai Lama is much more of a, a philosopher and a the theologian and a scientifically minded scholarly person as well as a meditation master like the Karmapa was. The other thing I would say about the Karmapa is, and you can see this in a film about him called The Lion's Roar that was made in the 70s or 80s by Chugyam Trungpa's disciples of the Shambhala group. In America, I think they made it bolder, the lions were, and it has some old footage of him as he used to teach us to meditate. And in this case, he's sitting like this with his like thousand watt, ten thousand watt stare. Because in the Mahmud tradition, we meditate with eyes open, not closed. And uh, around him are the fifteen or twenty year old tukus of the lineage, the high 
reincarnate master, Shama Rinpoche, Sitsu Rinpoche, Jamun Kantual, Vero Chinsi Rinpoche, Gyalza Rinpoche, Chikini Rinpoche, Sokni Rinpoche, Choling Rinpoche, and a few others. So he's giving like them Mahamudra lessons, maybe in 1964 or 6, when they just come out of Tibet and he gathered these tulkus and was educating them, taking care of them. Because they were refugees that came out separately, some on horseback or some being carried by their servant or uncle if they were very young. And he was sitting there like this, and they were all like this, meditating together. And I tell you that there's no meditation instruction like that, like seeing that. And for me, for those of us who have karmic connection with him. Just seeing it as it is, being as is. That was his special message. Mahamudra, everything is it, this is it, as it is. Imaho, Kamapacheno. with this master in person there was nowhere else to be that's how I felt and that's how it is with one's true master whether they're alive or dead whether they're here in person or not we tune into them and co-meditate with them intermeditate with them invoke their presence like when we chant kirtan to our Hindu guru, Maharaji, we practice guru yoga, a combination of devotion and wisdom development practices, devotional practices, bhakti and jnana, wisdom development practices. And then we are totally here now, and we are, we feel like the right person in the right place at the right time, and it's true. We're not faking it till we make it, it's true. So homage to the guru and the guru within. May you all realize it and embody it for a better world and a better future to be possible, the better future that begins right now. I bow to that and you don't overlook it.